start out saying, I think I can be the first Swede to be the head of, of Daimler? I don't know if that was the very first thought that crossed my mind. What kind of car do you drive? I drive the S-Class. You test all, all the models that, are, that you guys are making? or It's one of the privileges of the job. So if I had to buy some stock today, should I buy stock in Tesla or in Daimler? Which one's likely to go up? I don't think you will ever have me recommend stocks of competitors. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave it, it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist, and nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? Daimler-Benz is led today by Ola Kalenius, who is, among other things, the first non-German to run Daimler-Benz. He's Swedish, but he spent his entire career there and recognized for his intellect, his hard drive, and his ability to make things work within a large bureaucracy. Like all people running automobile companies, he has some challenges. Challenges from ride-hailing companies, challenges from electric car companies. His biggest challenge, though, was trying to convince me to buy a new car. I haven't bought one in 23 years. I like my Mercedes-Benz station wagon, 88,000 miles, does quite well. I don't have to worry about anybody stealing it. And he told me that actually, maybe he's not such a good salesman, that if I hold on to the car, it'd actually be worth a lot more as a vintage car. So for the time being, I've decided not to buy a new car. But if I was gonna buy a new car, he's convinced me that one of his cars would probably be a very good car to buy. Make sure everybody understands, um, you are not a German, right? No, I grew up in Sweden, and uh, see that we have the Swedish ambassador here today as well. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I can see you being the CEO of Volvo, maybe, but um, how, did you, <laughs> how did you get to be the CEO of a well-known German company? Has there ever been anybody not German who's been the head of Daimler before? No, and of course, I was attracted by this uh, three-pointed star, but uh, yes, I'm the first non-German to take on this role. So your predecessor, uh, Dieter Zetsch, was very famous with a very big walrus-like mustache. Did you feel you needed to have that to get the job, or <laughs> you didn't think you needed that? Did you ever consider growing a mustache? Well, up until this very moment, I haven't considered it. <laughs> um, if it sells more cars, <laughs> may, may, <laughs> maybe I might. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so tell, let's tell everybody how you actually came to be the head of, of Daimler and Mercedes. So you grew up in? I grew up in Sweden. I grew up in the south, in Malmo, okay. which is the uh, third biggest city uh, of Sweden. Uh, but through my university studies, I came in contact with the company and uh, have been with the company for my whole career. So you joined in 1993 after you graduated from uh, school and graduate school, is that right? That's correct. Okay, and did you start out saying, I think I can be the first Swede to be the head of, of Daimler, or did you, did you think it was a realistic chance? Uh, I don't know if that was the very first thought that crossed my mind. <laughs> Uh, I guess I just wanted to try to find my feet uh, around the company in the beginning. Uh, I was fascinated about uh, the products, uh, but uh, this big company has given me a lot of opportunities, and uh, many years later, uh, okay. the greatest opportunity. Today, the company is in, the, in three parts. Can you describe what the three parts of Daimler are? Yes, we have essentially three businesses. Uh, the one business that I think everybody in the room knows uh, it's the car business. Uh, with uh, Mercedes-Benz cars and vans, uh, uh, the leading premium luxury brand in the world, uh, and the first car. Our uh, original founders, Gottlieb Daimler and Carl Benz, they invented the car. So that's what everybody knows. But of course, we are the biggest uh, truck and bus maker in the world as well, which is our second division. And our third division are uh, the financial and mobility services that support these industrial okay. Uh, entities. All right, let's talk about the car division for a moment. So um, most people know it as Mercedes-Benz, but where did the name Mercedes come from? Well, originally the company, as was the name of the founder, was called Daimler. Uh, and he founded the company back in 1886. Uh, and uh, about 15 years later came a, uh, uh, a famous 
Austrian industrialist. His, industrialist. His name was Jelinek. He was a racing enthusiast. And he went to Gottlieb Daimler and his main chief engineer, Wilhelm Maybach at the time, and said, make me a racing engine. I want to go to Nice, and I want to compete in this race, and I want to win. So they made him an engine. They made him a car. He won the race. And the prerequisite was uh, the car should be named after his daughter, Mercedes. And the rest is history. So Daimler changed the name of the product, not the name of the company, changed the name. He just loved that name, Mercedes, right. and it became Mercedes. I suppose her name had been Josephine. Would be calling this Josephine <laughs> Benz, or? It would have been a Josephine Benz, even uh, if it would have been Brunhilde, maybe that uh, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll see. But Mercedes Benz works quite well. And of course, the Benz came later on as right. the companies merged in the 20s. So of the cars, how many cars a year does uh, Mercedes Benz now sell? Now we're at about uh, 2.4, 2.5 million. Okay. So roughly, it's about 80 million cars are sold a year around the world. Yep. I think it's something like 17 million in the United States, 28 million in China, and I don't, Europe is roughly the same as the United States? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The biggest market for cars in the world is China. I think I said they sell 28 million or something like that last year. So are, is that where your biggest market is as well? It is uh, for our passenger car division, by far and away our biggest market. With, uh, last year, we sold about 700,000 cars in China. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Are those cars, are they manufactured in China? Uh, most of them are manufactured in China, and some of them are manufactured in other places. In fact, with our operations here in Alabama in the US, we are the, one of the biggest industrial exporters to China. Uh, so uh, we rest on local production, but also a global production network. Now, you, you've lived in the United States as part of your career at Daimler? Yes, I've been uh, twice in Alabama. I actually started out my career after the uh, trainee period in Alabama. And I came back later on as a CEO of that operation. And you became a big Alabama football fan or not? I became a very big Alabama football fan. So on Monday of next week, watching LSU play Clemson is very difficult for me. Okay. Uh, but because we have been spoiled with okay. so many championships, I guess we're going to have to stand down on this one. Yeah. So, so if I had a car that was manufactured in Alabama, an identical one manufactured in Stuttgart, and I asked you to go in it, could you tell the difference between those two cars? No, I couldn't, because it is the same. And uh, we switched, uh, actually, more than 25 years ago away from a made in Germany, which is, of course, a, a seal of quality, to say, uh, made by Mercedes. So okay. if it's made by Mercedes anywhere in the world, it's exactly the same standard, same standards in every plant. So you make a lot of cars in the United States, but you make some outside the United States. So. Uh, are tariffs something you care about very much? Uh, tariffs is very important to us because, of course, we rely on global supply chains. So we rely on being able to build a car in one place and export around the world, like we're doing with the SUVs right. in Alabama, right. uh, and have uh, goods right. going back and forth. So yes, of course, uh, global open markets are very important for us. So when you're in Washington, for example, do you ever talk to government officials and say, by the way, we don't like tariffs that much? Everywhere we go, we have the same message. Uh, uh, if we want the cake to be bigger, uh, open markets have been a very, very good way to make a bigger cake. So whether we're here in Washington or in Beijing or in Brussels or in Berlin, it's the same message. Tesla's market capitalization is now $86 billion, and yours is like $59 billion. So is it embarrassing to you to have Tesla have this big market cap? Maybe it should be an encouragement. We want to create value for our shareholders. And we're not going to sit back and just say, is, is that market cap uh, enough? We're going we're gonna to go okay. for it. Of the cars that you produce every year, 95%, uh, uh, I assume, are internal combustion carbon using engine cars. Is that right? Uh, at this stage, uh, because of course uh, the combustion engine has worked so well, yes, that's okay. true, but we're on the verge of a new era of mobility, so gradually that will change. Uh, when will your electric cars really hit the market? Well, you could say that we actually were there before the market was there. We were the ones that put uh, in Europe to start with the first volume production electric car into the market, which was our urban brand, Smart. That was back in 2007. We were there, but nobody else was there. 
So, uh, so maybe we hesitated for a little while, but now we're in a, 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 a massive product offensive. This car is in the market now. Uh, we will bring it to the States beginning of next year. In the next two to three years, there will be a whole family of cars in this so-called EQ range. Are you trying to be carbon neutral by, was it 2036 or something like that? Uh, we have set uh, an ambition that we call Ambition 2039. 39. What does that mean? Uh, the key was we launched this last year to say, in 20 years time, we want to provide our whole new car fleet carbon neutral. Technology agnostic, but carbon neutral. So that's where the 2039 comes from, and uh, uh, because that seems far away for many people, even though that is a massive industrial change of the business, we have made a, an interim target by 2030 to have at least 50% of that okay. fleet, either fully battery electric or plug-in hybrids with a decent now, range. Now, for carbon-related cars, internal combustion uh, engines, there's always a fight uh, about what the mile per gallon standard should be in terms of uh, what governments require cars to do. So in this country, there's been a debate, a certain Obama standards, there was Trump has different standards, there's California standards. What is your position on what the um, mile per gallon standard should be? Uh, with Ambition 2039 that we uh, presented last year, we have made kind of a, a mental switch and a very clear uh, decision that uh, our ambition is to provide CO2 neutral mobility. We know it's not easy. We know that there are a lot of challenges on the way there. So we're on a, uh, we're on a journey, uh, and that is a worldwide journey. So almost regardless of which standard you have in different markets, the toughest one right now is in Europe. We feel that we will meet every one of those standards. Uh, and uh, that's why that is almost now a secondary debate to us. And we will, of course, apply the same strategy across the world. Uh, Tesla has made a big start in the electric car business. And in fact, Tesla's market capitalization is now $86 billion, and yours is like $59 billion. So is it embarrassing to you to have Tesla have this big market cap? And it shouldn't be just to you. The General Motors and Ford together, their market cap is not as, same, as high as Tesla. So why are all the big car manufacturers you know, being left behind by Tesla? Uh, maybe, maybe it should be an encouragement. OK. Uh, of course. Uh, uh, it's the job of every company to create value, and we want to create value for our shareholders. And we're not going to uh, sit back and just say, is, is that market cap uh, enough? We're going we're gonna to go okay. for it. But there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the whole uh, business is in transformation. There's a lot of investment coming with this, uncertain markets, uh, pressure on, uh, on uh, costs and margins. So I understand that there is a certain nervousness in the market. But if uh, another startup that is going for the new thing can generate those uh, kinds of market caps, then maybe there's potential for us. So if I had to buy some stock today, should I buy stock in Tesla or in Daimler? Which one's likely to go up? I don't think you will ever have me recommend stocks of competitors. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm a true believer in the company that I'm uh, okay. uh, working for, so uh, go with us. Uh, but of okay. course, read the fine print. This is an unsolicited piece of advice, and uh, we have a lot of disclaimers and financial information you need to read before okay. you make a decision. So what's the biggest challenge that Daimler faces today? Is it Tesla? Is it US regulations? Is it uh, just competition from other companies? What's your biggest challenge? There are so many. <laughs> it's, uh, 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 of course, juggling a lot of ball at, balls at the same time. But I would say the overriding transformation, almost disruption of the auto industry, is going CO2 free. That's a technological challenge. It's, of course, an industrial footprint challenge. Uh, but it's uh, during the many years that we will do this, it's also a financial challenge. Right. So to balance that out, I would say, is, is the biggest one. And who's your biggest competitor? Well, we have the traditional Germans. For some reason, in southern Germany, you have four brands, us plus right. three others, that like to uh, uh, push each other. Uh, but you have uh, uh, sometimes new players, like the one from California and others. We watch carefully what's going on in the competitive landscape, uh, but try to make sure that our position as a brand that stands for the promise of the future, that we're always Right. In, in, the, in the lead in this, in this uh, competition. I have this car I got in 1997. I'm still driving it. Uh, what do you think the residual value might be of that? Um, well, that is what we call a young timer. 
it's a young timer, but it's on a verge to becoming an old timer. So what's the best new feature you're working on that's going to excite people in a year or two or something like uh, that? If I told you that, we would have to do the men oh. in black thing. Oh, OK. Uh, so uh, uh, okay. we have some spectacular things, obviously. But you keep your cards close to the chest. And then when you have a big reveal, you go, ta-da, here it is. So um, what kind of car do you drive? I drive the S-Class. Okay, and um, you test all, all the models that, are, that you guys are making? Or? It's one of the privileges of the job. Okay. If, if, if you like cars and you like uh, engineering, uh, you, have a lot of, you have a very big sandbox that you can play in. And uh, we test our cars all the time. So on a regular basis, we drive uh, all the prototypes of the things that are okay. in the pipeline. Now, I um, know that new cars are very appealing to some people because when you get in them, they smell new. Um, <laughs> What, do you try to do something that makes the car smell new? And is that part of appeal? And um, is there some places where smelling a new car is not appealing? Uh, it, it is part of, uh, part of the appeal. Uh, in, in traditional markets uh, like uh, Europe and US, yes, you love that. It's of, course, it's, of course, the leather that you mainly smell. But you have this new car smell, and people love it. It feels fresh, maybe like buying a very nice new handbag or something. Uh, one country is different. It's China. They want to have a neutral. Uh, uh, they want to have the car neutral, n uh, not smelling like anything. So there we actually go out of our way to engineer it such that when you step in, you just have a really? neutral space. So um, when you go to buy, when somebody goes to buy a car, if they go in, they say, I want a car with these, this color, this thing. Do you have those cars made up in advance, or do people get them made specifically for their tastes these days? It's uh, different from market to market. Our experience here in the US is that most times when, uh, when a customer wants to buy a car, they, after they have done the research on the net and, and done all these things, and they actually get to the dealer, they want to drive home. So you have to have the, the car finished and spec'd there. But if you want a tailor-made suit, it's not a problem. And that's uh, very often the model in Germany. So the tailor-made suit is available as well. And that takes how much longer to get that? Uh, depending on which model and what the demand is, but usually I would say at least three months you would have okay. to wait if you, if you get that. Okay, so what's the most popular color that you make for your cars? Well, in Formula One we race with the silver arrows, and uh, silver has always been uh, right. the color of Mercedes, so it's silver. What are the most exotic options you have that aren't part of the standard package? Well, of course, never underestimate the uh, creativity and ingenuity of the engineers. So once we make something standard, we come up with something new. One fun feature on the SUVs that we just launched uh, last year is what we call uh, uh, an electronic chassis system that can actually individually regulate the height uh, of each wheel instantly. And a camera reads the road in front of you, so when it sees a bump, it adjusts before you hit it, so it's like being on a flying carpet. Really? That's one of those things. OK, well, um, all right, I'll take a look at that. But um, <laughs> um, why should somebody buy a used car? You have all these new cars out there. They're buying used cars. Is that a good idea? Uh, it is a good idea if you buy a certified pre-owned from Mercedes. Of course, they are made, <laughs> uh, they're made with good quality, so they will, they will last f uh, forever and a day. And as I said, it's, a, it's, a, it's an aspirational brand for many. And uh, especially in the German market, the first Mercedes for many is a used Mercedes, because you get into the price bracket where maybe you can, right. maybe you can do it. Well, suppose somebody is aspirational, and they say, I want to say I have a Mercedes, but I don't actually have that much money. What is the cheapest price that you can pay to get a Mercedes? Around 30000 how much? Around $30,000. $30,000. So some yeah. dealers here will say that they will sell a Mercedes for $30,000, right? Very uh, bare bones entry model. OK. Does it have a steering wheel and everything on it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, will move, it will move from A to B. And since, it, since it's Thanks. Mercedes, it will move from A to B in style. All right. Let's suppose I say, I'm not that cost constrained. I want to impress my friends with the best Mercedes I can possibly get with every option, every feature. What would that cost? Thirty-five thousand, or in uh, in that case, uh, you got to go for it. 
And of course, the flagship of our range is the S-Class, the upper end. Uh, and if you want to be a little bit more ostentatious, you can do the Maybach S-Class, and then we're talking 250,000. And how fast does that car go? Uh, the car could probably go above 300 kilometers an hour, but we put in a restrictor in, in, in it so it won't go faster than 250. Okay, well, that's a, uh, I'm, I'm it's not, enough. It's that enough. might be okay yeah. for me. But uh, okay, so if I said I want a nice German made car, even if it's made in Alabama or somewhere else, South Carolina, wherever it might be, but I just don't want to buy a Mercedes because I just want to try something else, what should I buy? Should I buy a Porsche or should I buy a, uh, a BMW? Which would be the best one, do you think? Is walking an option? <laughs> So if you were giving advice to somebody that wants to buy a car today, what would you give the advice to them about how to negotiate the best price and uh, make sure they're getting the deal that they want and the car they want? As I said before, uh, don't buy the price, buy the product. Uh, and look at the product features. So uh, I'm slightly biased here, uh, but if you think about safety, quality, uh, exciting technology, uh, efficient powertrains and so on, Think about that, and whether it's $1,000 up or down, in the end, that matters less. And perhaps, in total cost of ownership, buying a more expensive car, in the end, with residual value, might even be the better buy. And the residual value, is that holding up for Mercedes better than other cars, or? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. So uh, uh, the second-hand market of Mercedes is a very attractive so like one. I, I have this car I got in 1997. I'm still driving it. Uh, what do you think the residual value might be of that? Um, well, here's a little known fact. If you would have gone back to, let's say, you said 1997. 97, right. It's 23 years old. Yeah, so that is what we call a young timer. It's a young timer, but it's on a verge to becoming an old timer. If you had, in 1997, invested your money in classic Mercedes cars, right. the right classic Mercedes cars, as in old SLs and so on, and you look at the index of that over the last uh, 25 years, it beats the S&P 500 and most other asset classes that you could have picked. So my advice now oh. would be hold on to that one, because <laughs> it will it will come into its own. And okay. like, a, like a Bordeaux wine, it will then get better over, over right. age. Well, now I'm going to hold on to it. Yeah. OK. <laughs> so you, are, you became the CEO when you're only 50 years old. So you're only 50 now, right? 50 yes. years old. So um, very young by my standards. I'd say like a teenager, practically. So um, how long can you do this job? You can do this for, there's no age limit. So you could do this for 15 or 20 years. Your predecessors both did it for about a dozen years or so each. Uh, I'm not thinking about that so much right now. Now it's about uh, doing what I do today and then tomorrow and, and navigate through this transformation. So it's not on my mind, uh, but I know it's going to be a, uh, a very exciting journey here uh, as, as the whole company uh, is in transformation over the next year. So three. let's suppose somebody is in college now. Um, They're saying, I want to join a nice industry. Why should somebody want to join the automobile industry? Well. Uh, since I just came from the CES in Las Vegas, which stands for this is what happens tomorrow uh, at the electronic show, uh, if, you go to that, uh, if you go to that now compared to 10 years ago, even the tech companies use cars to demonstrate their future technologies. So I, I don't know if there's a more exciting business than the auto industry. And uh, we're always going to want to go from A to B or transport goods from A to B. And now we have more technological tools. So this is an industry uh, in motion, in transformation. And what's more exciting than that?